We had uh, a very productive day. This is Nicolas Bornois of Capital Inc. with uh, a tremendous agenda. Uh, great speakers and panelists uh, today. Uh, and we are ending with uh, a uniquely powerful and uh, insightful uh, panel. Uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, John Calamos Sr. and uh, Mario Gabelli for uh, joining us uh, in the session and to John Kudunis for moderating it. Uh, I am really honored to have uh, all three of you uh, concluding the 20th annual Capital Inc. Closed End Funds and Global ETFs Forum. It's a big milestone for us and I would like to thank you for your enduring support over the years, which uh, made it possible to reach today's milestone. So thank you very much. And without any more delay, I will turn over the uh, floor to uh, John Kudunis to kick off the conversation. Thank you very much to all three of you. Nicholas, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here again this year uh, with such distinguished speakers. So without further ado, I think uh, everybody knows the panel here. Let me start um, by uh, picking Mario's brain. Uh, a lot of people are questioning what's going on with the Fed today. Uh, will the Fed, the Fed slow down uh, its bond purchases in any kind of meaningful way? Or, you know, will this, uh, the fears of continued slowdowns and uh, perhaps these variants that we're seeing in the COVID-19 cases keep the central bank's monetary policy status quo? What are your thoughts, Mario? John, I'm, uh, you know, for the last 45 years, 51 years, I started as a sell side analyst. I would take a laser and focus on a balance sheet. I would focus on the 10K, which was not around at the time, but all the details. So what we really do bottoms up. For example, I spent 45 minutes reading the new annual report this morning on, on 20th Century Fox. It just came out, a lot of details. So when you're asking me about that, I just reflect what I hear from the companies. And what I hear from the companies is that the uh, notion of uh, cost increases are rising. Uh, they basically had in, bought uh, equipment and supplies, in this, primarily supplies in this January, February, March. And under FIFO accounting, that was the first out as prices rose. So they had, okay, gross margins, profits were okay. Now the Fed is looking at data. From my point of view, what you're, what you're seeing in terms of this debate in Washington is bringing everyone to say $28 trillion. Should we eliminate, I even heard some radio commentators this morning talk about just eliminating the debt ceiling. For me, uh, we owe the money, okay? And then we should pay it. But the notion of talking about it brings to everyone's attention how the money is being spent, whether it's being spent officially or not. So now I'm Jay Powell and I've got Elizabeth Warren on my back. And I'm looking at the whole notion of, should I raise my foot off the, uh, uh, the uh, accelerator? Yes, I think he's gonna do that. And the next uh, meeting, he'll give you even more indication. I think he sees the signs of inflation being uh, more persistent and longer than he might've thought five or six months ago, plus inflation expectations are picking up. So when I look back and I say, look, you know, with a 10 years at 150, uh, Inflation is at whatever the number is now, four and a half, five, uh, in terms of the data that's gonna come out on a short-term basis, whether it's used car prices, rents, uh, oil and gas, and uh, those kind of things, and more importantly, wages. The companies I talk to are all raising the wage uh, dynamic. So uh, I do think that you are at the end of, uh, the beginning of the end of, uh, you know, the, the amount of money that's flooded the system. And now the question is the pace of withdrawing it. And the market is saying, look, I've got these bank stocks. Uh, they're gonna benefit from, from NIMS. They're gonna benefit from a variety of things. So it, it's a wonderful time. It's a lot of interesting equations. And then we have the North Koreans, the Iranians and the, and the Chinese on Taiwan figuring out how do they get their, their uh, day in the sun. So John, nothing's wrong, nothing's changed. I've been doing the same thing since my first investment in 1955 with Eisenhower president. <laughs> All right, well, that, that's a great answer. Thank you very much. I think that was pretty insightful. John, yeah, I don't know if, uh, if you wanna add anything to that or should we go on to the next one? We can go on to the next, that's fine. All right, my next one, question is to you. This current administration is obviously proposing large tax increases. Um, if these are enacted, 
what impact do you think these uh, contemplated tax increases will have on both the fixed income and equity markets? Well, I think people really undermine the importance of fiscal policy. Uh, as Mario pointed out, if you go back to the 50s, 60s, 70s, and overall fiscal policy has been very, very important. So uh, tax increases are still, will, are undetermined at this point. Uh, hopefully uh, they don't undermine the, the uh, economic growth. Uh, that's my fear there is that they, they do tax increases to slow the economy. So that's, uh, that's not, uh, will be not good for the markets. Uh, we, uh, we will have, uh, you know, the policy of how this plays out, but, uh, uh, you know, it's fiscal policy on tax increases, increased regulation is, is really uh, not good for the markets and different industries. Uh, the increased regulation, uh, you know, today they're talking about hiring more people in the IRS than they are in controlling the borders. You know, it, so fiscal policy uh, is really important here. So um, I, I think that's something uh, that's uncertain in the markets. Uh, obviously, uh, these markets going forward, the volatility uh, will be there because of this. And uh, obviously, the uncertainty about inflation is Mario pointed out it is also a big factor. Mario, I'm sure uh, my guess is you'd want to add a little bit to that. No, yes. I break it down into corporate and uh, individual tax rates. And from the corporate point of view, if you bump it from 21 to 26, there are some other 25. There are other considerations. Uh, John, for example, am I going to be able to write off 100 percent of my equipment that I buy the John Deere farm, the, 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 the farmer in the United States? It needs equipment. First, he ain't getting it right now because there's a shortage of delivery. There's mm -hmm. a pent up demand for a lot of things. Uh, secondly, uh, do you worry about the non-US portion of the earnings? Will there be a minimum tax? But let's just make it simple. One company located in the United States, 21% tax rate, it goes to 25 and make out the entire cash flow for uh, corporate America was US. We're talking about going from like $400 billion to four hundred. billion. 30 billion, everything at constant, plus the growth rate and nominal uh, for uh, cash flow. It's just insufficient, but it's an important psychological element to say corporations, in quotes, are paying their fair share. From an individual, it's an absolute disgrace, an absolute disgrace that they can't get rid of carried interest. They can't get rid of uh, 1031. They can't get rid of a, the 852B6, which is damaging uh, uh, the cash flow of uh, investors. Uh, and so, Higher rates, uh, in, uh, you're in uh, Chicago, I'm in New York, and uh, you know, you're paying, uh, if you're, and I'm in Connecticut, but it's the same thing. And uh, federal is 37, going to 39 point odd. There's a 2.35 uh, in uh, tax on top of that. In addition to that, you got a non-deductible state and local taxes, which they may want to raise a little bit. And so then the question is, what's the impact? I think by now the expectation is that something's going to happen. Okay, is the step up tax beta on debt? Is that too micro? Yeah, but it's a very important thing because my clients are saying, what do I do? Do I sell now? What's the cutoff date? Was it September X or is it going to be something later? Is it when does it take effect? So there will be an impact on a short term market. Uh, if they raise the taxes in uh, January 1st, 2022, you'll see a lot of year end uh, window dressing and a lot of year end planning and you'll see a lot of other things happening. So I don't want to spend too much time on it, but it's it's an element that goes into our thinking. Yeah, I think the I think the one thing they keep forgetting about, and we've seen that over the years, whether it's uh, Reaganomics or even when uh, John F. Kennedy, the first thing he did when he got elected was lower lower taxes to get the economy. Is that lower tax rates increases the revenue coming to the the country? Doesn't. Uh, it doesn't decrease it. So that's that's what they keep forgetting about. Yeah, you're, you make a good point there. On the other side, uh, from my point of view, we do have a crisis. We all want to chip in to help. We'd like to do it a little more efficiently. You know, <laughs> giving a rich person in the south side of Chicago uh, money to buy a Tesla 
Well, somebody else on the south side, of, and that's a bad spot, but the south side of Chicago can't afford even to put a charging station. I generally use the South Bronx where I was born and, you know, uh, as an example. So some of these important things, the climate change is very important to, and, and so on. But you go back, uh, I have a problem not with the math necessarily. I have a problem with the total percentage if it exceeds a certain amount, but I have a problem in which way it's communicated. Okay, if I'm a basketball player like, uh, you know, MJ uh, in uh, making a lot of money, should I, uh, you know, should I be uh, singled out as a wealthy person uh, who's, in, who's not appropriately uh, uh, contributing to society? I, it's wrong. The American dream, the American dream of which I was a part, you know, if you work your, uh, uh, from five to nine and uh, you uh, are work at it and find something creative and you're helping somebody or doing something interesting, uh, you know, you get rewarded and then you pay your dues over time. And we see that going on not, not only in the United States, but globally. Capital goes to where it's treated best. So if, if some countries have a lower rate, guess what? They get more capital. And, and you know, the more capital we have coming in and the, the economy growing, increases the revenue to the government. And that's what they should be focused on. John, I, I'm going to pull a Charlie Munger line at a Buffett annual meeting. I, there's nothing more for me to add on that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's change gears here. Uh, this question, let, let's, um, let me uh, hit John up on this one. Well, first of all, both of you guys are... Uh, well-known convertible bond managers, and I know that you utilize them not just in your uh, open-end funds, but your, in your closed-end funds. Given our economic outlooks, how would you expect convertibles to do over the next year? John, why don't you start on this? Well, I, I think uh, convertibles uh, should do well. Uh, you know, we've just gone through a couple issues that are out there, the inflation, uh, government policy, going to cause volatility in the market. So, uh, you know, my experience with convertibles going back to the 70s was uh, it's, it, it ends up being a good way in which to manage risk. And we even saw that in the last uh, month where we had a down market and convertibles held up relatively well to the equity market. So, uh, you know, I think, uh, and, and the other positive about convertibles right now is it really uh, is the issuance, uh, you know, we're on track to uh, be issuing about $164 billion in converts this year compared to $158 billion last year. So really convertibles are a way for companies to access capital. Uh, and we're seeing that not only here, but, but globally. So um, uh, it's, it's been a, a very active market uh, going forward. And from a uh, volatile period and whether interest rates go up or not, our experience over many decades in here is uh, convertibles, when, you're, when you have a fear of interest rates going up, like they are right now, convertibles make a good tactical allocation to, uh, you know, as an alternative to fixed income. Because in those markets, when interest rates went up, uh, convertibles have uh, done well. Mario, anything to add on that? Well, I think the uh, part of that rationale is that if uh, a company has pricing power and inflation goes up, they can raise uh, revenues, maintain a gross margin, SGNA will rise lower, and you have a rising earnings to match the increase in inflation. So the converts, uh, even though they may have the <laughs> lowest nominal coupon rates in a long time, they have the uh, underlying equity that's going to have earnings power that will rise. And that's what John was doing. I'm just fleshing that out because he hit it dead on. Okay. So, Mario, because this is uh, a conference that we're supposed to talk about uh, closed-end funds and uh, making sure I keep to Nicholas's uh, agenda here, how are convertibles kind of uniquely suited for a closed-end fund product? Well... Let's step back one giant step. We uh, started a convertible fund, open end somewhere in the late 80s, and we uh, asked the shareholders to convert it to a closed end fund. So we've had one in place for about 25 years. 
uh, during the period about X number of years ago, I got to know uh, the Dinsmore family and uh, they joined us and they are taking the Bancroft and their fund and becoming part of our family and have taken on the management of not only the convertible fund, but several others. From our point of view, the important dynamic is that when the markets have a correction, like in this, uh, May of uh, February, May, there's been many Mays uh, of uh, where you had significant downturns. The most recent one, obviously, everybody looks at is the uh, month of March of 2020, or even yesterday or whatever. The benefit of having a closed end fund is that you don't worry about redemptions necessarily. You do not have to match your cash for outflows for uh, distributions. But that gives you the right to look at uh, anyone that wants to sell a, a particular instrument at any point in time and look at your portfolio. And it gives you a, a good comfort that you can think longer term. Simple as that, not more complicated than that. And John, specifically for convertibles, why, why are they good in, uh, in this environment? In, well, in actually, actually um, that got us interested in, in the closed end fund market back at uh, when the uh, market was going through a correction back in uh, 2000, uh, the uh, convertible market held up well. Uh, when, uh, when convertibles are going down, uh, they look more like a straight fixed income or maybe high yield even. Uh, we saw a great opportunity in the yield there, and we started our, one of our first convertible uh, uh, closed-end funds back, I think, was 2002. And uh, provided excellent uh, yield uh, going forward. So, uh, you know, I think, uh, uh, and we've uh, obviously, you have used them in all our other closed end funds over time. We like the uh, idea that we're creating income. Uh, we have an opportunity for, for equity uh, participation as well. And it really helps us manage risk well. So, uh, you know, the convertibles uh, have been uh, very, Beneficial. Now, our, our funds aren't just all convertibles. We do have asset allocations between different asset classes, but, but they do offer us a good risk managed way to you know, get exposure to the equity market. And they're providing that income. The closed end fund market to me is, is a way of, uh, for investors to really get income. That income distribution in the, in the uh, market is really important, especially in this very low interest rate environment. And the income from closed end funds haven't changed that much with the with the rates going way down the way they have. So it's been it's been a good income uh, alternative for investors. Okay. Well, we've seen a little bit of change in the closed end. Uh, market a couple of years ago, uh, the, we they introduced what they call this load no load structure, where the advisors were absorbing all the offering costs associated with the with the IPOs. Uh, so it kind of uh, rejuvenated the market, if you will. I think in 2020 there was about 30 billion dollars worth of issuance of uh, closed end funds. Um, you know, it's been exceptionally vibrant. Uh, Mario, what's what has been contributing to the success, you think? Let's go back one giant step. I started the first closed-end fund somewhere in 1900, and Chuck Alvin had started his, and I looked at it, and I decided that having read about closed-end funds just on a historical basis, that we started a closed-end fund. We had an underwriter, Shearson Lehman, whatever the firm's name was, Loeb, uh, blah, blah, and... Um, Basically, the structure was you, you issue the fund, you, there's a, a load charge, the, uh, the manager gets uh, on a $20 fund, he gets $19, the uh, client puts, uh, buys it at 20 and uh, within a period of time, it generally goes through a discount because you're investing in it. So the new structure makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, I'm not so convinced, you know, 12 years for some is a long-term horizon. The, you know, for public companies, you just have to amortize the P&L. Uh, in terms of what uh, Cohen and Steers has done, what John is uh, now private, uh, what we would have to do. So we're just trying to find new ways to take, you know, the 13 or 14 closed end funds we have, maybe even give rights offerings to all of those fund holders and let them subscribe to a new fund. Uh, from my point of view, uh, because what happened in 1970, uh, the, the 87 after we went public, 
with our fund, we put a 10% distribution policy, which more or less have been maintained now for the last of uh, close to uh, 40 years. And uh, so we have those kind of distribution policies, which underscores what John was talking about for those that are looking for current return. Some years you earn it, some years you over earn it, and you try to uh, match the hatch, so to speak, and try to grow the NAV and try to keep the public price close. And uh, sometimes it doesn't work on a short-term period. And then you have a lot of uh, organizations that try to uh, manipulate things to uh, take advantage of uh, those short-term irregularities in the marketplace. Okay. Anything to add to that, John, or should we move on? No, I, I, think, uh, I think he's right on, and it's really important. I, I think what happens is in the closed-end fund market, uh, it's, it's not uh, marketed very well or advertised. So it, we, we, you know, we've really attempted to get out there and educate uh, not only the shareholders, but others on the benefits of closed-end funds because they don't tend to be, since there's no commission uh, when you buy that, that type of thing, uh, we, you need to really uh, educate investors on the, on the positive aspects of owning uh, closed-end funds. I think that's, that's an, another, actually another question that we had oh, is, you know, what is the education process and how important is it in this particular sector, the closed-end funds, uh, you know, how important is it for clients to understand? Uh, Nicholas does a great job in having this forum, but is there a lot more out there than this, Mario? Um, and, 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 you know, how important do you think it is? Well, there's a lot of fundamental work. We had a conference on uh, the whole subject of, uh, you know, heartbeat trades and 852B6. That's just too technical for uh, anyone that wants to get into it, uh, the ICI and Morningstar don't even want to touch it and it's their mistake. But uh, that's an important intellectual dynamic that is important to understand how to pay, how does an in investor for his IRA, how does he do it for his 401k, how does he do it for the savings plans that they're interested in? And even if you can't get them into a 529, we have had problems of doing that as to the compounding effect of uh, retained earnings over an extended period of time. Uh, so what's the easy part? The easy part is to go out and have forums like we're doing today. Okay, so I thank uh, everyone for having me participate. Uh, and basically, uh, uh, but it's a long educational process. And in the, in the uh, time period involved, you've had some disappointing and some challenges. If you look at the number of funds that have been in existence uh, and how they've declined because they've been uh, without using a bad word, uh, they've been attacked by, uh, uh, and Main Street investors have been hurt by that process. So we've got to do a lot more in terms of uh, the regulatory environment, the pricing environment at IBO, IPO price, which you're seeing a lot of new uh, dynamics here, but also uh, what you just uh, said, uh, and that is the educational process. Okay. In, in part of that educational process, John, is uh, what we've done in our closed-end funds and others have, as well is we have what we call a level uh, income distribution. Uh, just because the market went up and down, we're not changing. Uh, we're paying out a monthly distribution, and we're, we try and manage it so that it's, it's pretty level throughout a long period. And, uh, and that is, I think, beneficial to the shareholders, I'm getting an income stream. Uh, we're managing, you know, sometimes the income stream is coming from, from yield and interest income. Other times it's coming from capital gains, whether they're short-term or long-term. But we, what we try and do is manage it in a uh, level distribution rate, which uh, I think shareholders appreciate. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. In the past, a lot of the investors have really benefited the fact that some of these closed-end funds uh, can use leverage. Uh, not a ton of leverage, but has, you know, it has significantly uh, helped the returns on these closed-end funds. As of late, there's been some pushback from some of the underwriters regarding the use of leverage. They fear the interest rates, uh, you know, may affect borrowing costs as they go up and that you know, the funds might get ahead of themselves. 
Do you see this changing? And if so, how would you manage closing funds to adjust accordingly? Mario, what do you think? I think we lost uh, Mario here for a second. So why don't I, uh, John, you're still on, I think. Why don't well, you, you know, there's been a, a huge benefit to using leverage in a, a close end funds, uh, ah. again, to have that income stream uh, and keep it, you know, level over the years. So uh, I don't understand the pushback, quite frankly. It's been very beneficial. Uh, you know, we have, we have uh, regulations, of course, that we have to follow there. Uh, and the benefit to the shareholders, uh, because the closed end fund has that kind of assets, um, we're, we're, we're able to manage the interest rate that on leverage. Uh, I think today our leverage cost is only around 1%, you know, and, uh, you know, so we're able to take advantage of that. And we do, you know, well, what would happen in a rising interest rate environment where your leverage cost goes up? Uh, you know, obviously, you could decrease leverage. And the other way that we've used leverage in closed end funds is we'll issue preferred shares. So we'll have the leverage out of preferred shares. Uh, so uh, that's managing interest rate risk the best we can. So I don't know what the pushback is. I think it's been very beneficial to the closed end fund market. Yeah, I, I, you know, from my point of view, like our closed end fund, uh, the convertible fund uh, that the Dinsmore started in 1971 has earned XYZ over an extended period of time. If you step back, what do we expect if you had a uh, ownership of an ETF that tracked the, the uh, economy of the United States? What's GDP going to grow at? What, uh, let's assume two and a half percent. If you get lucky, the, uh, the uh, economists will tell you it's productivity per population. And that's real. And then inflation. And then on top of that, what is gross margins going to happen to if one, the corporate America? And what are the uh, EBITDA and what's tax rates and what's the multiple on these earnings? And so you look at what is the market going to earn? And I think the notion of that you can go in today, which we just did it uh, on Monday, uh, you can raise X dollars at a five, a 4% return uh, on a preferred uh, and then you can also have a, a layer of preferreds that you can call because uh, they're, uh, you have a call date on them. So it gives you flexibility of running the company. No different than managements would do at running their business. But here I'm running it for the owners and for the shareholders. And that's important, John. And, and it works. Uh, oh, not necessarily every day <laughs> or every week or every month. And, uh, you know, as we talked before, uh, what happens to the nominal interest rates next year when the Fed does those things that... Uh, we think they're going to do. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. All right. Let's say we had a, an audience of all advisors, right? And advisors are very important to our business because they sell a lot of our products. If we had the perfect world and all the advisors were educated on closed end funds, how might they apply this as they're speaking to clients in terms of their overall investment portfolio, how would you suggest that they market it to their clients as a part of their entire portfolio? John, why don't you uh, take a whack at that? Yeah, well, we have to remember too, uh, you know, the closed end fund is not just about the convertible market. So you know, the asset allocation, it takes advantage of emerging markets, international markets, the whole thing. So it's, it's really, uh, plus the income stream from it. So I think the advisor can, you know, can utilize uh, the closed end fund market in their asset allocation. Uh, we're looking at like, we've been talking about the convertible closed end funds as an alternative to fixed income. What are you gonna do here with a, you know, 10 year bond rate at 1.5 or whatever it is, how do you get anything out of fixed income? So uh, good, good alternatives to fixed income. Um, as, as well as other allocations that make a lot of sense. And even a, uh, a little bit more asset allocation towards the equity. It's, it's, it's really a low volatility equity strategy. So I think there's ways that the advisors can use that beneficially. Yeah, John, I take a more simple approach. Uh, you go fly fishing, what you try to do is match the hatch 
the advisor is so fundamental in dealing with uh, individuals that uh, w and looking at the individuals uh, portfolios and looking at how their emotions are when markets go up or down, they ha have to say, I want to customize a fund for you that matches your psychology. Uh, everyone that's an advisor, every, all of us know that when markets go up, some clients will say, how come I didn't invest even more? Why don't you put me on margin, which we don't do. Uh, and they, when it goes down, they're saying, I got to sell. And we had clients in the uh, uh, 1976 uh, uh, that couldn't handle it, the, the market declines uh, the, of the uh, late, uh, uh, early 70s. So over the next 10 years, what and how does this product fit in? And so it fits in, as John said, if they've got a fund in a convertible area that's providing a general, uh, an income stream, how does that match portion become part of the uh, client portfolio? And it's not easy. And you know, that, nothing is easy. When you're dealing in the, in the world of dealing with so many clients, uh, you, you try to understand how this particular investment vehicle works and which one does it work for? So that's uh, the, my approach and it's uh, matching the hatch. Yeah. That's great. So I'm fortunate here to be amongst two of the best investors of our time. And, uh, you know, we've gone through a lot of the things that we were speaking about in terms of convertibles and more specifically closed end funds. And uh, I don't know how much time we have, but as, as we close here, I think people would be very interested to hear this is a volatile market. We saw what happened yesterday. We're seeing what happens today. Do you have any advice, whether it's in the closed end market, in the convertible market, in any markets, how to navigate these choppy waters? And I'll, you know, Mario, I'll, I'll, I'll let you lead off and then maybe John can close on this. Right. Well, if I'm a, you know, it depends. If I'm someone playing with Robin Hood, and I'm a newbie in the markets and I've been around. I saw this in the 50s. I saw it in the 60s when the tape readers were trading. Uh, we saw it in the 70s. We saw it for every decade. You go back to the 1930s. I haven't gone back much beyond, you know, 1854 when I was there, John. I, <laughs> you know, the point, markets are going to be volatile. But how do you maintain your uh ability to manage what you want to do and accomplish your goal? Is it maintaining wealth? Is it increasing wealth? Is to give you economic flexibility? Is it a 24-year-old that wants to build up a, a nest egg so that they can say, you know, they have their own options in life? So we really, uh, I, from my point of view, knowing that the, the uh, markets will be volatile, knowing your own psychology, knowing that the advisors got, are going to understand your psychology, you get yourself a good advisor. Uh, you know, if you try to do it yourself, that's fine. Start reading annual reports. If you like uh, going to shop at uh, Home Depot, well, maybe you should have bought some stock. If you like the fact that uh, Apple 13 is coming out, you know, and they have that, or do you like the new game, or do you like gambling? Are you going to watch the, uh, uh, this is not for the guys in Chicago, but are you going to watch the Red Sox Yankees and put a bet <laughs> on it? Maybe you should buy some of the betting stock. So there's a lot to do, and I, I don't have a simple one answer fits and uh, one size fits all. Uh, John, I just think, you know, over the next 20 years, if America goes back to allowing creativity, allowing what they've done in, the, in freedom of choice and allowing the meritocracy to work, allowing the uh, rule of law. And Gary Gensler is going to do a good job because you do need a sheriff, uh, in, even in Adam Smith's uh, rule of law. And so when you get that happening, I, I'm very optimistic about the, the next 20 years. Now, does that mean uh, come the middle of February or March when Powell may or may not be there? And that's a different issue. John, any thoughts? Yeah, they well, Mario really uh, said it well, you know, and, and I guess from a longer term view, uh, you know, I've always looked at the markets from from a top top down view. What the markets are all about is it's really the pulse of the nation. What is going on in the world? What's going on there? The markets are reflecting that. So, uh, you know, this has been a very uh, confusing market because we've never had a COVID that created the downtrend and now it's coming back and so there's a lot of 
just a lot of variables out there. So, uh, you know, our philosophy, you know, when I started in the early 70s was how do I manage risk? When I first got in the market in the early 70s, I think it went down 30 or 40% <laughs> in a couple of years. And so managing risk has been really important. And it's still very important going forward. So uh, you, you really don't want to, you know, you want to really be able to manage that risk going forward. Uh, a lot of uncertainty in here. And it's really hard to predict. Well, gentlemen, it's been a real honor. Thank you for your time. I think the audience would really, really appreciate this. Nicholas, uh, if you're there, you want to come on in. There's any other questions that you may want to ask? There it is. You're on mute, Nick. Nicholas, is there anything you want to ask from uh, this distinguished panel? I think he's on mute. Well, just uh, John, while he's uh, doing that, I just echo some, you know, tops down thoughts. The wealth of the American household came out the other day at $147 trillion. The only, uh, the debt was only about 17, uh, 19 trillion. The only troublesome part of that financial uh, snapshot with student loans, and we've got to do something about that. And one of the proposals that uh, would be to allow them to pay it out of pre-tax dollars. I mean, if you're earning, working, and uh, pay it off. But the second part, we're having a meeting tomorrow with General Motors. They're going to have a 30 or 40 analysts there. This pent up demand for cars for 2022. The consumer has the wealth. The consumer has the need. <coughs> and uh, we had run into a structural shift so a shortage that we have to bring and on shore. Housing, that's another long runway for the, uh, for the economy. One goes into the consumer sector, one goes into industrials. And uh, when we look at companies double ordering, so we're very optimistic about the economy for 2022. Uh, uh, John is off. Uh, Nicholas is now able to ask any questions. I was full I'm, of bustering. I'm right here. <laughs> well done, Mario. Nicholas, I hand you the panel. Is there anything you want to close with? No, well, I'd like you to take uh, a little bit more time because frankly, we do not have the opportunity to listen to so much wisdom. Uh, so you have touched upon a number of key points, but I think it would be worth talking about um, economy, the investment climate, uh, how you see the market uh, keeping up. So, and John, do you have any questions from the audience, or do you take or you don't take them on the Zoom uh, capabilities? I don't know how it works. Let me see if there's anything. Um... We have some uh, positive comments, but no questions uh, from the audience. I Let me you. ask: Does anybody have any uh, questions? Why don't you go ahead? I'm able to see them. Well, the questions that, you know, I, I, I mean, we covered some of them already. You talked about the Fed and so on, but, uh, and we do have uh, a closed and fund market that has been particularly robust. Uh, it hasn't happened for a number of years, but now you see the closed and fund market bring a number of IPOs of mega deal sizes to the market. Do you see that trend continuing? I think there's another element, Nicholas, that I didn't bring in earlier, and we're not necessarily going to adopt it with our existing funds because we have lots of sh shareholders that bought it for a reason. So we don't want to necessarily transform the nature of the investment policy. But uh, Gary Gensler understands the need for changes in the capital formation structure. Should close then funds because of their very essence of being uh, available for long-term investments, should they be allowed to have even more or less? Uh, and how should they position themselves in the ownership of private equity and late stage venture capital? And uh, then, uh, you know, uh, should the new ones that we launch say have 30 or 40%? And some funds have done that already, but the funds that I have, I'm, I'm thinking about a new generation, kind of the next gen of, uh, of a closed end fund that allows that to be done so that it's the buyer understands what I'm what our firm is doing, 
with the skill sets and capabilities we have. Uh, we don't have that currently uh, to go into uh, uh, private equity uh, in, a, in the existing closed end funds. We understand private equity. I mean, you know, I, I run a telephone company that made 35 acquisitions and a bunch of spinoffs, and we have a team that do that. That would be revolutionary. And I think it would create uh, a whole new asset class or the opportunity to investors to tap into a new asset class, clearly. Uh, by the way, since there is a closed end fund conference to a large extent, I wanted to hear from you what you see as the benefits of the closed end fund structure in the current investment environment for investors. You have ETFs, you have a lot of other opportunities. Um, closed end funds obviously remain uh, retain their appeal, as we have seen from the IPO uh, market. Maybe you can elaborate a bit more on that. And do you see more of the closed end funds to be on the uh, think think income side? You, see, I mean, you talked about private equity. Where do you see that going? Nicholas, that's a good point. I think uh, you know the notion of having a closed end fund that invests in preferreds, as an example, several have done that. Uh, you know, that's an, uh, an example of someone trying to buy the preferreds of other closed-end funds uh, this, or buy preferreds generally of which closed-end funds. But what, uh, you know, John has accomplished at uh, Calamos and is, you know, very good. A, a product of a convertible fund is a very good product in terms of matching ice, the clients. But you have to uh, be in a position of, looking at zero interest rates, how much of the new uh, issues are at zeros, and then to figure out how you time it. And the beauty of the closed end fund is that they will have the, val the available liquidity to figure that out over time. Obviously. So maybe uh, from the two zones, if we have any comment. The question? So maybe uh, if either of the two zones would like to comment on this? Well, look, I think that we're seeing, uh, we're, we're trying to bring another close on fund in the market. And there's a line, there's a lineup uh, of uh, different uh, companies that are bringing stuff all the way through the end of next year almost. Uh, and it's hard to get in. Typically the market right now digests uh, one large close and fun a month. And I don't know that that's going to accelerate. What happens is some of the bigger uh, 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 broker houses and banks uh, need to be on it so we can get a good distribution on them. And so they like working on one at a time. And uh, as of right now, we're seeing the calendar. Uh, we're trying to line up for uh, early next year, but it's full to almost the end of next year with some very big uh, names that are common to this space. So, uh, you know, I see it continuing. We're seeing it both in munis um, and in equities. Um, and, um, you know, I think it's, uh, it's gonna continue to do this way. Look, when you're looking at, even though interest rates went up a little bit, you're looking at some of these closed end funds that can give you a steady return of some great yield, seven, eight percent and higher um, on, a, on a basis, there's going to be a need out there for a long time. Uh, rates may go higher here. We definitely see signs of inflation, but there's also other, you know, other f factors of technology that keep it down. And also the fact that our rates are still much higher than other parts of the world and in other economies where you know, their treasury bonds are trading negatively, there's still going to be a bid for, for, for U.S. bonds out there that'll keep it down. And then we also, I know we talked about this a little bit earlier, and if I might say, um, you know, the debt has gone through the, the moon. And, uh, you know, we're in the middle of talking about adding to the debt. You know, how much can the Fed really allow rates to go up for us to actually be able to pay back some of this. So that's another controlling force that people have to realize uh, that that's, that's an inertia that's going against ever having these uh, rates run away. So if that's the case, and you can produce the yields that you, these two uh, 
market wizards have done in the past in these closed end funds, I see that continuing to happen for uh, the next several years. Thank you. Yeah, I can add uh, just a couple of things. We have to remember what, if you look at, you know, as Mario pointed out, going back many, many years in closed end fund market, what it's really doing is providing solutions for the period that we're in, uh, you know, 1970s, the options market. Uh, right now, maybe it's private equity. Uh, it's different. You know, what what can what strategies uh, will help the investors in here and in a closed end format? So they've changed very very much over the years. So we're looking for solutions for the environment we find ourselves in. Very low interest rate environment, low income, how do we have solutions for investors to get higher income? So that's that's what I, I like the idea about the private equity market too, because a lot of investors, that's a difficult market to, to come into. So that might be a, a good, good close-end fund as well. If I may bring in another topic that John Kudunis brought up initially, and I think it's a critical topic, the topic of secondary market support. So we see a lot of activity in the IPO market, uh, a lot of assets out there, uh, you know, managed under the closed end fund structure. I, I think it is very important to intensify and expand the uh, secondary market support and marketing activity by the closed end funds. So in that respect, I'd like to applaud you and thank you for the support you give to Capital Link. Uh, we are dedicated to the secondary market uh, support. But I think also the funds themselves need to employ more uh, marketing activity. I would agree completely with you. We're trying to do that. Exactly. I mean, today, for example, we had uh, a panel uh, of uh, analysts who cover the market, great uh, analysts, uh, but we haven't seen that universe expand. Uh, and I'm grateful for the fact that we have a number of uh, analysts who are very well known, very respected, tremendous uh, contribution to the industry, but it would be good to see that universe expand. One of the things that we've employed over the last year or so is our kind of our CIO series. And, uh, you know, since Kalamos has gone to a team of team approach, has been very successful for us. And some of these teams that are running some of these closed end funds for us, um, we have what, like a block. And uh, that's one way that we're trying to get out the message um, not just in the closing funds, but our different strategies that we deploy. But one of them, of course, is closing funds. And, and uh, that's another way that we're, we're doing that. Wonderful. Well, if you allow me, I think we have gone uh, about eight minutes past our uh, allotted time. Of course, I, with you on the panel, we can continue discussing for hours. Um, so if I may... Thank you, and also ask you for some closing remarks. I would be uh, grateful. So maybe I can start with John Kudunis, and uh, as I see on the screen, I'll go. <laughs> okay. Um, so I, I, I think we 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 we, we kind of asked uh, the gentleman to do that, but um, in closing remarks, I think closing funds. Nicholas, thanks for being a proponent. Thanks for being a leader in helping us in the secondary market. We think it's a great product. Um, I think I'm, I'm surprised that even more people aren't getting into it, but that's okay. Um, uh, I, uh, people that have been invested in our funds, especially the close end ones um, in the last several years have done very, very well in almost all of our funds, secondary uh, close end funds. So it, it's been paying off. And uh, like John had said, and Mario, it's a great way to get income, which is really, really the big question that most people, not just mom and pop, but the advisors are struggling with what kind of product that they can get um, their clients that can give them the kind of stable income stream that closed end funds have been giving for year after year after year. So, um, Without further ado, I, I give it to the experts on the panel. So maybe we can go to Mario and then go to John. No, I just echo the comments. Uh, 
Thank you for doing this. And you had a wonderful list of uh, individuals that have been highly identified and highly successful in the closed end world, talking about their various uh, our, uh, aspects of uh, their stewardship and their monitoring and their focus on the closed end world. So well done. And uh, thanks for having me. And uh, well, as someone has just asked the question now, I intend to do this for the next 25 years. <laughs> Uh, yeah. You know, Buffett's uh, only been doing it from uh, 1957, uh, so uh, I got to catch up. You have a long runway, Mario, <laughs> as does John. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I'll just echo that. Uh, thank you very much, Nicholas. I think uh, you made an excellent point that we've been discussing is how do we how do we really bring this to the attention to the secondary market, to uh, the investors, and uh, we'll work. We'll continue to work hard on that. So thank you very much for having us on, on, your, on your panel today. Well, I'm the one who thanks you. And uh, frankly, it's a wonderful way to conclude our 20th uh, annual forum. Uh, we look forward to the 21st one, hopefully to be in person so we can see each other in person. Again, many thanks. Uh, and I wish you a, a great rest of the day. Thank and you. if anybody has a question that wasn't answered, you could, you could figure out a way to contact us, and I'm delighted to answer all questions all the time. Thank well, you very much, okay. John, and John, and Nicholas. Well, Nicholas, and great thanks. seeing you. Thank and you I've got to go. I've got to get prepared for the Yankee Red Sox game. So good night. <laughs> good luck. Thank you. Thank you again. Thanks.